people would be brought in these camps, they'd be handed a telephone, and they'd be told, you need to raise $2,000 for your freedom, or we will either kill you or you will die here. Some of the human trafficking guards, uh, those who are the big investors, they also have a link with some government officers. So these government officers, they protect their business. How high up do you think the corruption goes? Too young people by the man who may die. In the spring of 2015, the world was stunned when hundreds of Rohingya refugees and some Bangladeshi migrants were stranded at sea in horrific conditions on overpacked boats. Abandoned by human traffickers after a partial crackdown by the Thai government, the boats were at first denied entry by all countries in which they sought refuge. It was a small glimpse at the plight of what the United Nations has called one of the most persecuted minorities in the world and a glaring reminder of just how unwanted the Rohingya are. Today, the flow of Rohingya trying to escape Myanmar by sea has slowed in the wake of the crackdown. Very little, however, is being done to get at what's causing the Rohingya to leave in the first place. This is Mahmoud. He's 17 years old and was rescued from a trafficker after spending 12 days on a boat last summer. His parents paid the equivalent of $413 after they were promised he'd be taken to a job in Malaysia. Walk us through the process of when you decide to go, how it works, and how you end up on the big boat. What were the conditions like on the on the boat? When you were on the big boat, did you think at one point that you were going to die? Mahmoud is just one of the tens of thousands of Rohingya who have been smuggled or trafficked since 2012. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees puts the number as high as 160,000. We're here at the western edge of the camps, uh, facing the Bay of Bengal. And these three ships right here, these are used by traffickers. It's the first step in the trafficking process. People are loaded into these boats before they're taken about 20 miles into the sea where there are giant boats waiting. Those boats are loaded extremely full, and then they make the journey to Malaysia or Thailand. The trafficking operations are actually quite complex. Wealthy investors, many of them in Bangkok, Bangladesh, or Kuala Lumpur, will purchase a large boat. These boats are sent to the western coast of Rakhine State where they anchor offshore in international waters, close to Sitwe or further north in Mongdao. The ship captain or other operatives within the syndicates contact local brokers in Rohingya communities, who round up and recruit people to fill the boat. They're paid by commission, and they tell desperate Rohingya that they'll travel safely to Malaysia, where they'll have a job waiting. The Rohingya are put on small boats. Payments are made to local authorities so they can get through. The small boats keep coming until the big boat is dangerously overpacked. If you're the first group to board, you could be stuck in horrific conditions until the ship fills up, which can take weeks. Once the Rohingya get on, everything is taken from them. Sometimes, they're given different colored bracelets when they get on a ship. Each color represents a different trafficker. So if a Rohingya is wearing a green bracelet, they are now owned by the trafficker who was assigned the color green. The syndicates may share the boats, but the human cargo belong to different traffickers. Once the large boats are full, they make their way to Thai waters and dock throughout southern provinces, near the Malaysian border, to unload their property. In some cases, vehicles operated by Thai officials are alleged to have escorted them. In others, Thai immigration authorities are alleged to have taken Rohingya into custody and then sold them to traffickers. Once these ships made their way to Thailand, uh, en route to Malaysia, 
usually this human cargo, and they were regarded as human cargo, would be herded into these remote camps in the jungle, held in a situation of captivity, and they would essentially be held for ransom. They'd be handed a telephone, and they'd be told, you need to raise $2,000 for your freedom, or we will either kill you or you will die here. Or another option would be to sell them off to a situation of slave labor. This was a cold, calculated business in the trade of human beings, men, women, and children. And they were making so much money that they had little regard for their human cargo that was dying, and, and in some cases in, in large numbers. Southern Thailand, where the mass graves were found in the spring of 2015, has been a trafficking hotspot where well-established gangs and criminal enterprises have connected with human traffickers. We met with a police informant familiar with the human trafficking system. His identity has been concealed for his safety. We know that there have been some mass graves discovered in Southern Thailand. Are there, do you think there are more mass graves around here? Are there more people that have been killed that, that haven't yes, been discovered? Yes, sure. Some of the government officers, they inform local authority to stop digging the graves because if they, they dig many graves, then the international community and uh, also the other countries, they can see the, some of the evidences with the bodies. So it will not be good for Thai reputation. So you know of other undiscovered mass graves that are around here? In the mountain, there will be uh, many graves. If we walk in the mountain, we will just uh, walk on, on, the, on the dead body. Matt Smith's organization, Fortify Rights, has been documenting mass graves and unmarked burial sites throughout southern Thailand. He took us to one of the sites. When Rohingya either escape from the trafficking syndicates or are, in some cases are found on the side of the road, they end up in the hospital. If they die in the hospital, the hospital calls a local community representative, essentially, who picks up the bodies and disposes of them. At another gravesite nearby, Smith told us why there's been very little follow-up by authorities. And you think there are sites like this pretty much all over the South? Yeah, absolutely. These, these types of grave sites, and actually some mass graves that are much bigger, dot the landscape throughout this entire region. Is anyone keep, like, are the authorities, is anyone keeping track of, of these bodies and these people? Is anyone letting their relatives know? Casualty recording has been almost completely lacking. And the reason is to, to hide evidence, to hide what happens. Precisely. Uh, you can see right here, uh, these are unmarked graves just with a, with a stone next to them. Um, they look like they were recently buried. Uh, I count six. How do you guys generally find out about these sites or about, about these situations? Speaking to survivors, speaking to eyewitnesses. Uh, in some cases, we've been meeting with government officials as well, uh, government officials who are trying to do the right thing. We've also spoken with um, uh, investigators in the Thai police department who have indicated that, um, that uh, they did have information about mass graves, but the investigation didn't proceed. The UN has an estimate of roughly $200 million was earned in human trafficking in Southeast Asia, specifically with regard to this population, as well as some Bangladeshis since 2012. Who's profiting off this? Transnational criminal syndicates are profiting off of this. Uh, government officials, not only in Myanmar, but also in Thailand, have been profiting off of this. People have, have become uh, hugely wealthy off of this trade in human beings. And no one's really doing much about it. That's right. And as so, some governments, such as the Thai government, uh, right now are attempting to convince the world that they are taking the situation of human trafficking very seriously. There's an ongoing trial right now against 91 people, in some cases government officials, who have been charged with criminal offenses um, related to the crime of trafficking. Unfortunately, there are huge problems with that trial. It, it appears as though it's a show trial, essentially. It has not even touched the tip of the iceberg. Those currently on trial are said to be mostly low-level offenders. While some higher-ups have been charged, sources told us most of the kingpins are not being pursued. So the real big bosses, the real kingpins, they've escaped? Yes, maybe they, they negotiated with the local authorities to hide evidences, and maybe they gave bribe. And also some of the human trafficker, those who are the big investors, they also have a link with some government officers. They do business. So these government officers, they protect their business. 
But there is evidence to arrest the kingpins. They're just not using that evidence. They're not going after them. Yes, we are very disappointed because they, they are still escaped. They are not arrested. And it's not just Thai authorities that are alleged to be working with the trafficking gangs. Authorities in Myanmar are also colluding. Vice News obtained a recorded phone call between an activist in Yangon and a trafficker implicating the Myanmar Navy and military officials in taking bribes to allow trafficking. Mm. We've just arrived in Bangkok. Um, from all the research we've done and all the people we've spoken to, it seems that there are still a number of traffickers that are here in Bangkok, sort of hiding in plain sight. Um, one of them has agreed to speak to us. Uh, he's an alleged trafficker. Um, but it's sort of a really murky world. A lot of these alleged traffickers actually work with the police uh, and inform on some of their competition. Um, they also claim that they're humanitarians that are, that are helping out uh, trafficked and smuggled people. So it's really hard to tell um, what exactly is going on. But he's agreed to meet with us as long as we protect his identity. A source later informed us that this man was reputed to be a smuggler and not a trafficker. It may seem like splitting hairs, but the traffickers use violence and deception where smugglers simply move people illegally across borders. What can you tell us about the trafficking situation right now? It seems to us like things have slowed down for a second. Have you been involved in, in helping the government or police at all deal with the trafficking situation? People have told us that you were involved in trafficking. How do you respond to that allegation? How high up do you think the corruption goes? The corruption is so widespread that the senior police investigator on the case has fled Thailand, fearing for his life. Major General Pawin Paksirin is currently seeking political asylum in Australia after implicating top officials in the Thai government, military, and police force involved in human trafficking. What happened after was a relatively sophisticated cover-up. What does that mean? Does that mean that there, there was no massacre? That Meaning that the UN didn't have enough uh, facts and was not able to ascertain enough facts that something actually uh, occurred. They saw children being killed. There were body parts in wells. The government that had just turned a corner was now perhaps complicit in crimes against humanity. <laughs> 